Sam Decker would have been all this while silently and gravely carving a large joint of hot bacon, fragrant slices of which he placed upon the edges of various people's plates, already well filled, while Crummy, seated beside him, added to the same plate certain quotas of pickled walnuts and roast chestnuts, was the only person at the long table who received the real significance of this deep sigh of his father's. He caught his father's eye as soon as he could. Aren't we going to have any music, father? he said. Matt Decker regarded his son tenderly from the end of the table and with an affectionate narrowing of his great eyebrows answered that he had just sent this Madeline player on a mission that he feared would prevent her from performing. But if you think it would be all right, Sam, my boy, we could get old Weatherwax in front of the kitchen to sing us one of his catches. And I suppose it would be no use trying to persuade Miss Geard. He smiled at Crummy as he spoke, to help us out with a song or anything. This word from the head of the table attracted the general attention to poor Crummy, who had already taken a certain risk of publicity by assenting to Sam's courteous request that she should sit by his side. Now she could not stop herself from blushing scarlet. It was one of the most charming sighs of Crummy's essential innocence, made all her flirtations, and when she was embarrassed she got as red as a little girl of ten. I'm afraid I couldn't possibly, Mr. Decker. Oh no, I couldn't possibly, Crummy murmured. There, there, a few more pickles for this one, Lily. Who is it? Oh, Jackie Cole. Yes, I'm sure Jackie likes pickles. And the girl did her best to distract the public attention away from herself. Perhaps you wouldn't mind, Louie, said Matt Decker, asking Weatherwax to come in and give us a song. I'll do it in a, a pretty girl like you asks him. This remark was greeted with guffaws of laughter from many of the company, for the goatish disposition of the vicarage gardener had become a popular byword. The silence following Louis' exit was now interrupted by the opening of the kitchen door and the end of the passage. From that position of the room came a hubbub of voices, pennies with witch-like tones rising above the rest and mounting up in a shrill spirals of sound above the murmuring growls of Mr. Weatherwax. The old rogue hesitated not to proceed Louis into the museum. Louis followed after him with an expression of self-conscious pride, as if he'd been a puppet whose strings she had was pulled from behind. Sam, who had cut by now the last slice of bacon that anyone could possibly call for, turned to Crummy and whispered in the girl's ear, Isn't that just like my father? He knows perfectly well that the old villain will shock half the people here, and yet he persists in lugging him out from where he's as happy as a cricket, and where Penny's there to look after him. Crummy expressed a complete identity of her opinions with those just expressed. Her eyes lingered for a moment, clinging timidly to Sam's like a goldfinch to a thistle head, and then, dropping her soft eyelashes till they were nearly rusted upon her cheek, she looked down at his hands, which were clasped very tight upon her lap. Her hands were. She began wondering if there would be any possible chance that he might offer to take her home that night. None of her family was there. She prayed to God that there might be thunder and lightning so that it would seem a monstrous thing for her to have to go alone. How lucky that Sally Jones lived on the opposite direction from that there was indeed no one here who came from her end of the town. If he only thinks of it, or if his father thinks of it, I believe he will. But she had no sooner begun to imagine what it would be like walking in the darkness of Sam's side or clinging to his arm amid terrific claps of thunder, then she was seized with a fit of shivering. Not violent shivering, but a constant recurrence of that sensation of cold shivering, which is described as a goose walking over your grave. Crummy became afraid lest Sam would notice that this queer, irresistible shudder kept running through her body. 
To herself it seemed so terrible apparent that she was intensely grateful to old Weatherwax for not waiting to be seated, but commending his ditty from the middle of the floor between the fireplace and the table. There was a really intense silly stillness around that candlelit, disordered table, covered with half-empty cups and wine glasses and with orange skins and nutshells as the great perspiring continence of the satirish garner composed itself into what he felt to be a singing expression. Mr. Weatherwax's singing expression was, as a matter of fact, little short of maudlin. What might be called a radiant imbecility beamed from that great face, the eyes of which were tightly closed. In the silence that awaited his first note, Sam Decker, whose car ears were as sharp as his ears of a fox, caught distinctly the sound from some round on the lighting above, of a low-pitched, miserable weeping. Sam had been all that evening aware of many things that had been unnoticed even by his father. He alone among them all had not been oblivious of that insubstantial shadow forming in the moonlight, melting away in the moonlight, and then reshaping itself there, swaying and hovering above the Glastonbury roofs in vaporous, convulsed movements, as if the atmosphere of that night contained an element that could gather itself up, condense itself, solidify itself, and take the form of the beams of a vast cross upon which this shadowy figure was hung. But Sam's consciousness of this vaporous shadow, twisting and turning in pain up there, now began to be bent and confused in his mind with the def definite human suffering that was going on below the roof of the vicarage but above the ceiling of the museum. Old Weatherwax's rumbling bass voice singing the following stave seemed to his ears to be a fit symbol of the world's attitude to both these griefs. The brewer, the master, the miller, and I had a hyper, had a filly, had a ding dong. When daffodillies look up at the sky, pass among boys, pass along. The brewer, the maltster, the miller, and I lost a hyper, lost a filly, lost a ding dong. When oak leaves do fall and when swallows do fly, pass along, boys, pass along. The brewer, the malter, the miller, and me found a hyper, found a filly, found a ding dong. They weren't the same pretties, but what's that to we? Pass along, boys, pass along. The brewer, the malster, the miller, and I left a hyper, left a filly, left a ding dong. Down in a grassy green grave for the lie. Pass along, boys, pass along. Many of the elder men present seemed to know this ditty well. They must have often heard the old man hammering it in the bar of St. Michael's Inn. Several voices, therefore, joined in that rather brutal chorus of pass along, boys, pass along. Matt Decker, who himself was no so congenitally ignorant of music that he could not distinguish God Save the King from the British Grenadiers, kept swaying his rugged gray head from side to side, not retaining any sort of time, but with a general idea of helping matters t forward by this token. Crummy kept a sly, sideways watch upon Sam's face. And when she saw that he had begun to work the muscles of his chin up and down and to lower his head over his plate and over the mutilated joint of bacon in front of him, she too allowed her expression to assume an air of weary melancholy. Instead of looking in old woolen wax, she looked with tender sympathy at the pathetically wagging head of the master of the house at the end of the table. The close of the gardener's song was greeted with resounding applause. Hancor, Hancor, screamed Mrs. Robinson in a shrill voice. Give us another, mister, cried the Nietzschean young man from Wallops. Old Weatherwax has cleared his throat, passed his hand over his brow, straddled his gated legs more widely, planting his leather boots more firmly, turning his head to wink at the square form of penny pitches, which is now blocking up the door into the passage. Shut his eyes tightly once more, lifted his chin a little, and began. <clears throat> 
With backslide and so against the bars, Pidgey. With backslide and so against the bars. With a flagon of Zomerset ale in me hand, there baint none us merry as we in the land. Beneath a twinkling stars, Pidgey. Beneath a twinkling stars. Hips and haws and up and down dale, and the devil may fill the old woman's pail. With a doxy like thee on my knees, Pidgey, with a doxy like thee on my knees, and his lordship plum spurred in me pie, and a sedgemore peat fire to best in it hot. There be luck in the barrelies, Piggy, there be luck in the barrelies. Hips and haws and up and down dale, and the devil may fill the old woman's pail. Like the crafty comedian that he was, Isaac Weatherwax paused at the end of the second verse in order to enjoy to the full an exquisite savor of rich response to which he knew himself entitled. It was at this point that Sam, under cover of the beating of heels on the ground, the knocking of knife handles on the table, clapping of hands, the well satisfies chuckles, the boisterous bravos and hear hears got up from Crummy's side and began making his way to his father's end of the table. Crummy followed him with a gaze of intense concern, but she discreetly kept her place, and indeed moved up a little closer to Grandmother Cole, whose seat was now on the further edge of Sam's empty place. She saw him ask some question of his father and caught a surprised look at the old man's face. This look was followed, however, by a grave nod as if he had said, do what you please, but I cannot see any good that can come of it. Sam paused at the door at the top of the stairs to ascertain from which of the rooms that sound of crying proceeded. Had his father let him take the girl into his mother's room, the one he always kept unused? And as he stood there listening, he became conscious once more, as he had been intermittently conscious of that night, of that vast, outraged shadow hovering there, in the moonlight above the roof of the town. He also became conscious, as if he were the executioners themselves, at that official assassination, bawling out some body ditty from the suburba of Rome, of the thick-throated gardener's finale. There be gammer's death at the sill, Peggy, there be gammer's death at the sill. And the Lord is oneself to be a hangin' for we, and Leviathan be comin' up out of the sea, and behemoth over the hills, Peggy, and behemoth over the hill. Hips and haw and up and down dale, but the devil may have we for wood woodman's bale. Now, it was not from his mother's room. It was from the spear room that the sound was coming. It was not the sound of crying now either. It was the sound of several voices. Some of them raised quite high. He strode down the passage, knocked sharply at the spear room door, and entered without awaiting a reply. <laughs> 